Hey, Al. Hey, Barry. Why did the druid get arrested when they attempted to summon a bunch of crows? Why? Attempted murder. It's time for Compelled Duel. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to Compelled Duel. I'm Barry. And I'm Al. And we are a single-player, co-DM'd D&D 5e actual play podcast. Previously on Compelled Duel. Good morning, sunshine. Are you aware that you almost took a swan dive into the death hole? Oh, shit, is that what that was? What are you talking about? What's going on? Whatever's in that hole in the floor in the tower, it's old, and it's dead, and it wants me. Well, fuck. Just need your signature on that, lass. It's the missive to the pirate court. Well, midnight swim aside, I'm certainly well enough to sign a piece of parchment. Tell me what you really think, Zed. Tell me about how you think I'm fucking crazy. You're fucking acting like it! They don't want to come home. And that's all I wanted after everything. I just wanted to bring them home. This isn't their home. It's your memory of it. Isn't it better that they're all places that have a future and not stuck in the past? I worry about Leo, though. The thing that wants him, it's meaner, and it's smarter, and there's no bargaining with it. I'm worried about him, too. You're dead, and it's my fault. And I'm sorry. But you don't get to take the people I love. It's a broken promise. Lero, you already know what you have to do. You see a huge, multi-masted sailing ship approaching with a plethora of ships backing it up. That's the Australian Navy. He's coming. Fee, there is a cold, salty sea wind blowing into your face. The chill biting through your clothes and the gusts tangling up your hair around your shoulders. You are standing at the top of the Tower of Luxtogallen next to your brother. As both of you look up from Leo's crystal ball to the horizon and watch the Australian Navy bear down upon you. Just logistically, as a little PSA from your dungeon master, I'm gonna put some things in perspective for you right now. Oh good, what I really need right now is perspective. You have with you on this island the entirety of your party, minus the captain, the teen squad, the Hierophant, and however many pirates are still left on the ship. And that is it. You have one ship and some change worth of people, and there are dozens of fully armed Australian warships coming straight at you. You are... fucked. What are you doing, buddy? Trying not to have a panic attack, thank you for asking. Next to you, Leo appears to be in the same boat. Pun intended. He watches this fleet of ships move closer and sucks in a breath through his teeth. (sighs) Fuck, 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 fuck. Okay. He reaches down and zaps his knife out of his bracer, and you see the blade of it start to glow as he casts a spell. What are you doing? Shut up! 
the blade of his knife keeps glowing for a couple seconds, and he shuts his eyes, tilts his head to the side as if he's listening to something, and then straightens up and looks back at you. Okay, the captain is almost back with our backup, but we need time. They cannot land on the shores of this island, Fee. It'll be a massacre if they do. We need to hold them off somehow. Isn't the ocean and the wind and shit all kind of your domain? I I mean, yes, but I'm all the way up here if you hadn't noticed. Okay, and they're a little more than a mile off, so what could you do if we get you down to the beach? Uh, not much. Once they got closer, I could probably take down a few of the boats. I could slow down a couple more. I, I, I don't think I have enough firepower to deal with this. I don't, I don't. Yeah, me either. Oh, we're fucked. (laughs) We're fucked. We are if we think like that. There has to be something we can do. Like what? Pick a god and pray? Leo's been turning his crystal ball back and forth between his hands frantically, but then pauses and slowly turns over to look at you. Pick a god and pray. Leo, I hate it when you repeat the things that I have just said back to me as if they are grand epiphanies. Then fucking stop saying things that give me grand epiphanies! Remember in the courtroom, back in Valdur? We did the thing. I was praying for any sort of way out, and then I grabbed your cape, and then Kimberlin and Kiva showed up and zapped us out of there. What if we try it again? He reaches the hand that is holding his knife out towards you, and nods down at where your cape is fluttering in the wind. You pick a god. I'll pray. I'm a priest. It's kind of what I do. And even if it doesn't work, it's worth a shot. Trust me? I do. So, Fee, what I'm presenting to you here is an opportunity for you, not a cleric, to use Leo's divine intervention ability from his cleric stat block. Much in the way you did back in the courtroom in Valdur when your powers combined to suck you into the celestial demiplane where you found out everything about Kimrel and Kiva and Alander and Justice, your powers and your brother's powers are now able to merge. And what that means is that you can roll for divine intervention. So you can roll a percentile dice against your total character level, which right now is a 15. And if you make it, Kiva's going to do something. You can also use your re-rolls from the Gift of the Stormbringer to try to do it again if you don't get it on your first or second or third shot. But if you choose to do that, those re-rolls will be gone for the day. Is this an option you would like to take, or would you like to try to find an alternative? Fee trusts her brother. She's gonna do it. Your hand wraps around Leo's, where it is still clutching at the hilt of his knife, and he reaches down with his free hand to grab the hem of your cape and wraps it around both of your arms. He starts to pray for all he is worth. In Kimmerlite Priest's tongue, which is, well, now I feel like I can say it's draconic, mechanically. Do you speak draconic? Uh, I do not. I made the conscious choice not to give Fee that language. Okay, so the words coming out of Leo's mouth are incomprehensible to you, but sound very ceremonial and professional. You don't know that he is just frantically saying, please do something. Holy fuck, please do something, over and over again. Your first roll on this divine intervention is technically a free one, so go ahead and roll me a percentile dice. Okay, first one. 52. Okay, you have all three of your re-rolls. Would you like to use one? Yes, I would. 
57. Okay, you have two more re-rolls. Would you like to use another one? Yeah, I would. 14. <laughs> How? How did you get the luck to be this good at fucking D&D? <laughs> <laughs> I'm exquisite. Uh, the, yeah, I had had a whole side quest planned for this, but sure. You are standing there with your hand clenched around your brother's as he is just fervently praying, and you feel a familiar sensation under your skin. It is the moment after you've been shuffling across a carpeted floor and you're just about to touch a doorknob. That feeling of static electricity that you get just before it shocks you. It's the way you feel before you cast a spell. But in this moment, it is bigger and stronger than you have ever experienced. It's more than your body can handle. You stagger forward, still clinging to your brother's hand, and your free hand comes down to grip at the metal railing of this long-defunct lighthouse. And that static electricity sparks off. There is a brief flash of light and an electric feeling that shoots through your entire body. And then that spark coalesces into a plasma-like ball of electricity and shoots up into the sky. There's a scattering of clouds overhead that suddenly get much thicker and that light grows and pulses and then a massive bolt of lightning shoots down into the sea. The light is blinding. It whites out your vision for a second. And when you can see again, an unprecedented weather event in Australia is happening. Because overhead, directly above this tower, swirling in hurricane force winds, the clouds are intermingled with the soft aurora-like lights of Kiva's mantle. For a second, it's just the lights, but then there's the lightning, and then there's the thunder, and then there is the brutal torrential rain that pours down out of the sky. You and Leo are both soaked to the bone in a matter of seconds. But, more importantly, the Australian Navy looks like they are not dealing with this sudden development very well at all. Leo snaps his head over to look at you, eyebrows creeping very high on his forehead. Okay, well, that was a thing. Um, is this thing gonna help the folks that we have coming to give us assistance? <laughs> the captain knows how to sail through a storm like this father doesn't you know what i'll take it we've got to warn the others go go yeah fee's going fee's running you head full tilt down this spiral staircase towards the bottom of the lighthouse leo is following you about halfway down you see sid kind of dart out of a room and start following both of you yelling what the fuck is happening? Congratulations, your holiness. The Australian Navy is beating down your door. Oh, son of a bitch. Language. Do you see Sabine around here? No, I'll say whatever the fuck I want. And he starts following the two of you down the stairs. The three of you tripping over each other land on the bottom floor of the tower. And while you and Sid are both making a beeline for the door, Leo stops at the bottom of the stairs and puts both hands up. Hold on, I need two seconds. 
that might be all you have, but go ahead. He dives off to the right through a big set of double doors that swing open to a gorgeous chapel. Polished wood pews, soaring ceilings, beautiful stained glass windows. He runs up right in front of the altar, brandishes his knife, and a big tessellation of arcane runes appears on the floor. He looks up at you and Sid, down at the glyphs, and nods briskly. Word of recall spell. Father's coming after that thing out there. We might need to get back up here in a hurry. I might not be able to cast a teleport spell, but I can get a couple people to a pre-designated space sacred to Kimrel. We're good. Let's go. Yeah, Fee looks at where Leo has cast this word of recall, nods, and then bolts out the front door of the tower. As you move away from your brother, a couple things happen. First of all, take a paladin level up. Okay, cool. Uh, That puts me at paladin level four. Instead of a stat increase, I am opting to take the shield master feat, which means that as someone who uses a shield habitually, if I take the attack action on a turn, I can use a bonus action to try to shove a creature with my shield. If I am not incapacitated, I can add my shield's AC, which is plus three for the type of shield to any dex save against a spell or some other harmful effect that only targets me. So not area of effect, but something that targets me that I make a save against. And if I am subjected to an effect that allows me to make a dex save to take half damage, then I basically have evasion with my reaction. I could just choose to take no damage. So what you're telling me is that mechanically, Ferrara Valsine has been divinely ordained to no longer take her father's bullshit. (laughs) yeah pretty much amazing incredible good for her and also you get another perk as you move away from leo towards the front doors of this tower you feel that same static electricity building up in your body it catches in your chest and then spreads out across the scale mail of your cape and The Gift of the Stormbringer has now achieved its final level up. So, you now have an additional ability. Once per day, you get one use of something called Legendary Resistance. And essentially what that does is it lets you say, If I failed that saving throw, no I didn't. Once per day, you have the option to succeed on a saving throw that you failed. That rules, all right. (laughs) It does, in fact, rule. Let's get the fuck out of here. Leo, as your sister bolts out of this tower, presumably with you on her heels, Kimrel's blade glows and shimmers in your hand. And the hilt gets very warm. Not uncomfortably so, but warm like you're holding on to something alive for a moment. As it receives its final level up. And you have access to a little thing that I'm calling legendary (laughs) unresistance. Which essentially means that if you cast a spell that has a save against it, and one of the targets of your spell succeeds on the save, you can decide that, in fact, they did not do that once a day. Okay, very fun. Um, I'm following Fee and Sid out of the tower, headed back towards the beach where the Magnificent Mansion is. The three of you hurry down the island to the beach. The door of the Magnificent Mansion is hanging open as your party are congregated on the beach. They are all sort of talking amongst themselves. You see Kalesa up on her tiptoes with a hand braced on Fen's arm, trying to, like, crane her neck so she can see the ships approaching better. You see Verity rubbing Ravane's back as he wrings his hands standing there. 
you see Sabine and Adana and you think Celica, based on the body language, all talking amongst themselves. And you see Mia standing apart from the group, looking out at the horizon at these ships and slowly filing one of their nails. Leo shoves past Fee and Sid and just charges into the middle of this group. Okay, great. We've all seen what's going on right now. Australian Navy, here, presently. We need to figure out what to do about it. Um, Sabine, you're the smartest person here. Mia, you have military experience. Let's figure out what's going on. Mia slips a nail file into a concealed pocket, and Sabine turns from her discussion with Adana and Celica, nodding as Mia saunters over. And from behind Sabine, your mother says, Um, excuse me, young man. She steps around Sabine, holding one finger up. In case you've forgotten, I know your father better than anyone here. Hell, I know him better than he knows himself. And despite my difficulties, I am a decorated veteran of the Vulduran War with over 50 years of experience as a military strategist. I'll be involving myself in this conversation. Yeah, no, you're right. Okay, so, Mom, Mia, Sabine, we need your strategic input in all of this, and Zed, I need you to hold my hand right now. Zed gives you a very casual two-finger salute and says, On it, boss. And then he is going to grab your hand as Sabine, Adana, and Mia all huddle into a circle around you. (sighs) Okay. Fee did a big, impressive magical thing, which will keep the Navy at bay for a while, we think. The captain is... Close. I couldn't get too much detail over a sending spell, but he's on his way. We need to figure out what we're going to do if the Navy makes it onto the island before our backup does. Sabine takes a deep breath, says, "Uh, I could move the mansion further up the island if we thought that would help. Put some distance between us and the shore at least, and I can close the portal anytime I like. For 24 hours, though. It would be risky to step out and re-up it, but if I can keep doing that, then theoretically we could stay in there indefinitely. No. No, that's not a solution. Hiding indefinitely isn't an answer. Fee? Fee looks out towards the approaching ships. And shakes her head. No, no, I... I don't think we'll be safe if we do that forever. And more importantly, I would hate to see what happens to the world if we just hide. Too many people are counting on us to do the right thing. The brave thing. And we both know what our father's coming for. The hole in the floor, the thing at the bottom of the tower. We have to stop him from getting there, I think. Across the circle, Mia shakes their head and says, Well, those are some pretty words, darlings. But all the pretty words in the world ain't gonna help anybody. When your daddy comes and busts down the door of that tower and pulls out enough magic to level a continent just because he wants it. So what the hell are we doing about that? What we have to do now is keep that fleet from docking off the shores of the island. Because if they do, we're all dead. It doesn't matter how talented anyone here is. It's a numbers game. We're looking at... (laughs) 10 to 1, at least? We don't know how long that storm is going to hold back the Navy. We don't know how soon the captain will be back. What we know is either we stop this here, Leo turns around over his shoulder and nods back up towards the tower, 
or we accept that this is the hill that we die on. The other people in this group surrounding you all nod grimly. Adana says, There's nothing we can do that's going to make him turn around. So it seems to me that the best course of action is... We hold him off as long as we can, we wait for reinforcements to show up, we try and get the navy pinched between two arms as much as we can. She smiles tightly and you see every second of her battle experience on her face. And then we sink every single one of those ships. Mia, on your other side, grins slow and sharp and full of malice. Well, darling, if you want me to pull out the big guns, I can, but I'm sort of an ace in the hole, not a party trick. And the smile drops and they just look at you and say, If you want me to do this, things are gonna get nasty fast. Well, I don't think anybody here would so much as shed a tear over the idea of something getting nasty for my father. You go find somewhere to post up and wait for ascending. If we need you, I'll let you know. I think the rest of us should fall back to the tower. Mia inclines their head at you, eyes flashing dangerously. I'll be waiting on your word, sugar. And then they spin on their heel and start heading up the road to the lighthouse. As they start to walk away, Sabine just kind of puts a finger up and goes, Ah, not that I'm doubting Mia's capabilities, but I've seen them fight. What are they going to do? Jump in the ocean and just swim over there with a dagger between their teeth? Um, no. Mia's like a few steps away at this point. And you watch their shoulders tense, and then they spin around and, to the group at large, yell, I'm a 75,000-year-old dragon from the moon, bye! And then they bolt. Leo takes a moment to just fully put his head in his hands. Okay, let's just... Everybody up to the tower, we need the high ground so we can have a good vantage point to see what's coming. Everybody stands there in stunned silence for just a moment, and then Sabine nods and goes, Okay! And then she dispels the Magnificent Mansion, and from the space where the portal into it was, all of the priests that you took captive spill out onto the beach at once. (laughs) They're all still, like, tied up, right? Yup. They're all still tied up. They just get spat out through where this portal used to be. Like a bunch of checks mix. Leo looks up from his hands to raise an eyebrow at them. Sorry about the weather, boys. You can lodge any complaints with the lady with the shield over there. Fee raises her eyebrows at all of these priests and crosses her arms over her chest. Oh, I'm not taking complaints. I'll do it again. Leo just goes over and grabs Zed's hand and walks away. Zed reaches awkwardly over himself to pat you on the head with his free hand as you're walking, and just goes, Uh, I feel like if I ask if you're alright, I'm gonna get punched. Oh no, honey, what are you talking about? I'm fine. My father's just right off the shore of the island, bringing the entirety of his military might to bear in an effort to kill us all and retake soul power over the giant hole full of dead people under the tower and plunge Australia back into 10,000 more years of darkness and deceit. I feel so normal. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, if the worst case scenario happens, we're dead and it's not our problem. Zed? Yeah, boss? I love you more than anything. What kind of fucked up bizarro world are we living in where you are the one painting doom and gloom and violent death as a silver lining and not me? Well, on the one hand, I'm proud of you for not bringing it up. On the other, yeah, there are going to be global consequences, but like, all we got to worry about is not dying. And, uh, according to your mom, unless something unfortunate happened in the chapel the other night, we got a 90% chance of that. 
Unless something unfortunate- Oh, fuck, we sure didn't- Yeah, because I don't have enough to be anxious about right now, Zed! You know what? Yeah, that's fair. I regret saying it. Let's- Let's go. Fee, you and your party head up this hill through the driving rain and frigid winds back to the tower. Leo and Zed are walking right next to you and Sabine. I'm gonna have to roll something for Leo real quick as you walk in. Oh, God. Um, that was a 14. That just barely doesn't do it. Leo goes rigid next to you and wrenches his hand out of Zed's. No, 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 not now. He takes one struggling step towards the hole in the floor, looking like he is fighting against his own body. I would like to roll a grapple check. Okay, roll athletics. 18. Okay, I'm gonna roll acrobatics for Leo. Welp, that was a 3, so with his modifier, that's an 8. You absolutely rush up behind him, brace an arm across his chest. You can feel Leo fighting against you, still trying to walk towards this hole. But the whole time he is saying, No, 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 I don't want to, I don't want this, I don't want this. Fee has still just, like, got him locked there. Um, I think she turns over and yells, Fen, do you want to help me out here? Fen doesn't have a super accurate idea of what's going on, but he leaps into action nonetheless, hoists Leo under one arm like a fucking football, and very effectively keeps him from moving any closer to the ghost hole. Zed's freaking out a little bit. He gets in between Leo and the hole in the floor and kind of crouches down to get on his level where he is clutched under Fen's arm. Hey, hey, Leo, look at me. You said it yourself. It doesn't get to have you, okay? Fee gives Fen a weighted look and just, like, nods up the stairs. Fen schleps your brother up this spiral staircase. I don't think anybody tells him to stop, much less where to stop, so he just heads all the way up to the lantern room, takes one step into this big circular hall full of skulls, and goes, Huh. You know, I'm starting to see how our religion comes off as weird to other people now. Really? I don't see it. And then she's gonna lean around to look at Leo and go, Okay, are you gonna- Walk all the way down the stairs and into the pit, or are we good? Now that you have gotten some distance from the ghost hole, Leo is just kind of hanging limply under Fen's arm. No, nope, I'm good. Uh, Fenandris, if you wouldn't mind releasing me. You visibly see Fen consider just dropping him for a second, but then he decides to be nice and puts Leo down much more gently. Leo walks back out onto the balcony around the lantern room with Zed hot on his heels. What are you doing? I'm looking at Fen and exaggeratingly mouthing, thank you, and giving him a thumbs up. Fen gives you a dubious look and a thumbs up back, but then turns around and heads out of the lantern room back down the stairs. He's not equipped to deal with this shit right now. The tower, being a big stone cylinder, has pretty good acoustics. You can hear the sound of a heated argument echoing from the very bottom floor, even from all the way up here. Sabine is saying, Look, the Magnificent Mansion spell is invisible from the outside, and we need somewhere to put you to keep you safe. It is too dangerous! And then you hear you snap back. You're out of your fucking mind if you think I'm gonna hide like some scared little girl while my brother is out there, Sabine. The captain needs his first mate, and I can fight. You hear the clamor of pretty much all of the teen squad shouting over each other at Sabine in protest. 
you hear glasses saying something about how keeping the only ammunition specialist on this island tucked away in an extra planar pocket doesn't exactly help win a battle. You hear Sunshine saying something about how you're going to need all the healers you can get. And then you hear stomping footsteps coming up the stairs and Lorelai Shakrana's voice echoing. No. No, I am done being protected. I am done hiding when it doesn't help anybody. It's never helped you or the captain. It's never helped Fee or Leo, and it certainly didn't help my brother. This is my fight, too. Several seconds later, you see Lorelai emerge up the stairs into the lantern room. She barely pays any mind to all of these skulls and reliquaries and grave goods. And you just storm straight past you out the open door onto the balcony after Leo. Fee takes a deep breath, nods to herself, and then she's going to head out on the balcony too. You head out this door back into the rain and the wind and the inclement weather. And the Australian Navy is much, much closer now. You do not need Leo to cast a clairvoyant spell to see the detail of these ships. They are coming for you as fast as they can, struggling against the storm, but getting uncomfortably close. Your brother has one hand white-knuckled around the railing of this balcony, and the other reached up to wrap around Lorelai's shoulders as she comes to stand next to him. And he is just staring at these approaching ships. Fee steadies herself, keeps one hand on the little knob to the door that leads out to the balcony, and says, Okay, I know we said Mia was a last-ditch option, but I think now might be the time. Leo is visibly shaking. You can't tell if it's from the cold or from his close encounter with the hole in the floor but his jaw sets very hard, and he doesn't look at you. Not yet. Leo, I really think. The ships are getting closer. You can see the detail of the Australian Royal Crest on their flags. Leo still does not look at you. Not yet. Leo! Not yet! The shifting purple and blue and green lights of Kiva's mantle keep rippling across the sky. And then you hear something odd. Fee, you know storms. You know the space between the flash of lightning and the rumble of thunder. And this is not a thunderclap, even though it sounds like one. And as you watch the Australian naval flagship come within a quarter of a mile of the docks at Luxtogallen, you hear... And a cannonball comes out of nowhere and completely takes the figurehead off the bow of the Iliana. Around the edge of a small spit of land that is blocking your view of the ocean beyond, you see the familiar silhouette of the Banshee expertly riding the wind currents of this storm, whip around and start gunning it for the Australian Navy. Woo! That's my man. Fee leans out over the railing, just laughing. (laughs) Told you he could sail through it. Leo also breaks out into an open-mouthed, awestruck smile. Holy shit. With how close this naval combat is to the shore, you can see the wind rippling at the sails of the Banshee and the shifting lights of Kiva's mantle reflecting off a shock of violently orange hair of the person behind the helm. The captain, like, 
I don't know the exact verbiage for how you Tokyo drift a ship, but he does that right up alongside the Iliana, and the cannons just start roaring, artillery slamming into the hull. And then something even wilder happens. Around this same spit of land that you just saw the Banshee emerge from, the entire collected might of the pirate fleet of the Zephyr Isles comes to back up their captain. And then behind them comes a fleet of massive steel gray Vulduran steamships bellowing coal black smoke into the sky. And then behind them comes a fleet of huge, well-armed Tordunian galleons. And then behind them comes a modest but formidable trio of Oskayan longships. Fee, you have done what you set out to do. You have bought your people enough time. Fuck yeah! Fuck yeah, indeed. This naval battle is now pretty evenly matched if we're looking at number of ships versus number of ships, but the thing about pirates is that they know how to take down naval ships. You watch the Australian Navy start to take an absolute beating from this collected pirate fleet. You hear cheers from downstairs as most of your party appear to have exited the tower and look out to watch what's happening down in the water. But in between you and Leo, you feel Lorelai's hand reach down and close really tight around your own. She looks up at you, eyes big behind her glasses with dark circles under them. Which boat is your dad on? Fee gives her kind of a confused look and then points out at the Iliana, which has just gotten the figurehead knocked off of it. The flagship, I would assume. Lorelai's posture goes very stiff and she lets go of your hand. Her other hand reaches down into the pocket of her dress and pulls out her wand with a white-knuckled grip around it. Thanks for the tip. And then she casts teleport. Lorelai! Oh, she's gone. There is the ripple in reality that you have seen around a lot of Lorelai's magic in the time you've known her, and she disappears before you can do anything to stop her. I'm going to roll on the teleport table for her. The Banshee is a very familiar location to her, and also she can see it. She's shooting for the crow's nest. So because it's a familiar location, she has a 75% chance of landing directly on target. I'm going to roll a percentile dice. 87, baby. She lands squarely in the middle of the crow's nest. You and Leo watch Lorelai disappear from in between you, and then see a distant flash of light and ripple in reality in the crow's nest of the Banshee. And she's up there. Fee looks at Leo and says, Now, now, tell me a go now! Leo's face shifts from victorious to panicked in a second flat. God damn it, Lorelai! And he zaps his knife out of its bracer and fires off a sending spell. And we cut to the deck of the Iliana, where there is a flurry of activity. Morlan Valsine is standing in full mage's armor, ready for battle. By his side is Alasha Dakarin, also in mage's armor, also ready. And behind him stands Reese Tormer, his bodyguard slowly sharpening an axe. And we see them all look up at the sound of a great beating of wings. From the island of Luxtagallen rises 
a massive, gargantuan copper dragon. The light of Kiva's mantle dancing over their scales, their eyes big and luminous, their wings beating furiously, kicking up a windstorm of their own. This dragon rises into the sky, looks at the Asturian navy, and swoops a jet of acid coming out of their mouth and dissolving the front of three ships in one go. Morlin looks at the dragon and then looks at Alasha and then looks back at the dragon. Is... uh, I'm sorry, is that a fucking dragon? (laughs) Where the hell did they get that? Alasha, also staring at this dragon, snaps. Is that really the question to be asking right now? As the dragon continues to swoop and, I would assume, start sinking ships, and this naval battle rages on around them, Morlin kind of checks out for a second. He looks out over the railing of this big Australian flagship with kind of a thousand yard stare. This is a weird day. Alasha looks over Morlin's shoulder, eyes going wide, and says, Oh, it's about to get weirder. (sighs) Darling, you know I don't do well with cryptic threats. He turns around to look at where Alasha is looking, and his eyes also go wide. Oh, what the hell is that? Alasha, sounding too stunned to be afraid says, that's Lorelai Shakrana. Over on the Banshee, Lorelai Shakrana appears out of a ripple in reality, stepping through the ether with her eyes fixed on the Iliana. It's a hectic situation right now. The captain is too busy trying to steer the ship around to look up and see her there, The crew are too busy manning the cannons and getting ready to board the ship to look up and notice her. But the pirate Pelican, who has been keeping lookout up in this crow's nest, snaps his head around to look over at her, as does the bird on his shoulder. Young lady, exactly what do you think you are doing here? Lorelai elbows past him tightens her grip around her wand and reaches out to level it at the hull of the Iliana. I'm making my brother proud. The wrath of House Shakrana condenses into one brilliant point of light that pulses and glows and intensifies and Lorelai casts Disintegrate at 8th level. A 10-foot square portion of the Iliana disappears, and the ship starts to sink. Back on the Iliana, Alasha grabs Reese, throws an arm around Morlin, and casts Teleport. She can see the nearest Asharian ship. She has a 75% chance of making it. 67, she teleports them off of the ship just as with a horrible creak of wood collapsing in on itself, the Ileana starts to sink beneath the waves. So, Leo, you and Fee and Zed are still standing at the top of the tower on Luxtagallen, the rest of your party outside yelling. You watch the gargantuan copper dragon that is your friend Dominio Sandis swoop on the Asharian navy, breathing acid and beating their wings furiously. As Lorelai teleports, you see, after a moment, a fucking laser shoot from the crow's nest of the Banshee to hit the Iliana, and then it just fucking sinks? There's another pause, and you see sailors on a different ship start to float into the air. 
You see another ship, sailors just pour off of it like they've been fucking scattered like billiard balls. Wild shit is happening. Like, even Mia pauses for a second. Leo puts both hands in the air and cheers. <laughs> That's my girl! Um, we are gonna have to roll on the wild magic surge table for Lorelei, or rather roll to see if she has to roll on that, because she cast four spells, so one. Uh, that's a natural two, but it's not a natural one, so she's good on the first one, but she does surge on a two now. Second one. Natural four, so she's good, but she surges on a three now. Third one. Natural eight. So she's good, but she surges on a four now. Fourth one. <laughs> Natural one. No! So she's going to have to roll on the wild magic surge as she casts this last spell. This could go either very good or very bad for us. Ah, okay. Leo and Fee can't see this happening at the distance they're at, so we cut briefly back to the crow's nest of the Banshee, where Lorelei is going full Rambo on the Australian Navy. She casts this last spell and then winds up to do another one, and there is that surge of prismatic wild magic around her that we have seen before. And as she opens her mouth to let out the verbal components of a spell, no sound comes out but a tide of fluorescent pink bubbles do. She looks at the bubbles floating away and goes to yell, Fuck! But then more bubbles come out. <laughs> Pelican, who's been standing next to her this whole time, looks over at her in concern. The bird reaches up to pop one of the bubbles with its beak and then goes, Oh dear. And we're back at the tower. Yeah, Leo doesn't see any of that. But you've seen all this destruction rain down. You are continuing to see Mia sweep down over the Navy. You are continuing to see a naval battle rage on. What are you doing? Yelling, jumping up and down, pumping my fists like a football hooligan. This continues for a minute or so, but eventually he adopts a more dignified composure and looks over at Fee. All right, well, we've got some actual military bargaining power now. I don't know about you, but in Father's Pocket or not, I don't feel great about the idea of the wholesale slaughter of people that are our people. Should I try to call it off? Fee, also trying to compose herself from yelling, <laughs> dusts off her skirt and says, I mean... We know what father wants, we're not going to give it to him. So, I, I don't think we're exactly in a position to bargain on either side. Maybe not strategically, but I know the old man. There's no time that he's more willing to make concessions than when his ego's bruised and he just got his flagship sunk by a teenager. It's worth a shot, I guess. There's going to be bloodshed here no matter what, but I think it's my due diligence to make sure that there's as little of it as possible. That's how an Archduke's supposed to act, right? I'm going to try. Give me a minute. Leo's going to turn around and walk back inside the lantern room. Can I count the time we've been hanging out here as a short rest so I can shift up my proficiencies through my rogue feature? Yeah, sure. Cool, I would like to take proficiency in deception, please. You feel that familiar bolt of pain up your spine, your breath catches in your chest, you close your eyes, I think, without meaning to, and when you open them again, your Uncle Valorin is standing on the other side of the lantern room. Leo walks over to him, raising an eyebrow. So, uh, that thing in my dreams, that was pretty fucked up, huh? Valorin just grimaces at you and kind of spreads his hands in a I do what I can type of gesture. There's a lot that I want out of all of this. I want justice for you. I want to stop whatever's going on in that hole. I want to fix 10,000 years of our family's mistakes. 
I don't want the blood of a civil war on my hands. What do I even say to him? I remember from back in Voldur, the only reason he was able to talk to me that one time is that I cast a message cantrip at him, and I had to roll or take psychic damage. Can I do that again? Uh, yeah, go ahead. That's a whiz safe. Yeah. Twelve. <laughs> okay. You take two psychic damage. All right, the dice are with you today. Leo flinches under that two damage against his max of 140 and kind of just glares down at the floor under his feet where the ghost hole is. Ow, fuck you. And you are faced with that same torrent of voices just roaring every soul in that pit shouting at you at once. Roll religion to hear your Uncle Val. Ten. I think he's kind of patchy, kind of in and out, like bad cell reception. (laughs) You embarrassed him, and you surprised him. Tell him you'll do it again. Leo smirks and twirls his knife around his finger by the hilt. I like the way you think. I'm sorry that you didn't get to live to be my uncle. We would have made a good team. Valorant's ghost, wearing the pajamas that he died in, with a big blood stain across his chest, looking tired, gives you a tight, bitter little smile, nods, and disappears. I'm gonna use my last spell slot to cast Ascending to Morlin. I do have all my 4th and 5th levels, though, so if I need to do it again, I still can. Leo tightens his grip on his knife, the blade starts to glow, and he sends the following message. Clearly this wasn't as easy as you thought it would be. You don't know what else I have up my sleeve. We should discuss terms. There is a long pause. And then, see thing. Your father sends back. Name a time and a place, darling. Leo clenches his jaw so hard that his teeth creak, but then uses a fourth level spell slot to fire off another sending. The docks. Dawn. Cease fire until after we've talked. I won't be alone, so feel free to bring your own backup. Let's settle this like men. You wait a while, there is no response. (sighs) And he always said I threw temper tantrums. Fucking petty power plays like a toddler. Son of a- Leo uses another fourth level spell slot and fires off ascending to the captain. Hold your fire, bring the fleet to shore. My father and I are talking tomorrow. We'll make plans once you're back. The captain sends back. Hi, see you soon. Okay, he's gonna walk back out onto the balcony with Fee and Zed, looking out towards the naval combat. We've got until tomorrow morning. Let's start planning. As you and Fee and Zed make your way down the tower to join your companions, and all of you walk down to the docks of Luxtogallen, you watch these combined pirate fleets form a circle around the island, just slowly sailing the perimeter. And the Australian Navy sits at a standstill. As you get down to the docks, several boats pull up and people start to disembark. You recognize the other pirate monarchs, as well as the captain, of course. The familiar members of the crew. And two very large silhouettes of a seven and a half foot tall Goliath woman, completely bald, holding a staff. (laughs) And a large, fluffy fearbolg riding on a giant rabbit, disembarking from one of the Oskayan ships. Leo starts excitedly smacking Fee on the arm and just pointing. 
Luffy is smacking you back. Your entire party is looking at you funny because none of the rest of them recognize this one, Anilva. Okay, are they on ships or are they in like rowboats? They are disembarking from one of the Oskayan longboats. You watch Katya of Clan Mistfoot, Chihiro the Snapping Turtle, also disembark from this longboat. Running, running. Leo is running and just jumping into this one's arms. <laughs> Scooby Doo style. You and Fee both bolt across the docks. This one, the Fear Bulg, jumps off of the back of the giant battle rabbit cuddles, yelling, Babies! Leo just hugs them super tight and buries his face in their fur. I missed you so much, your soap saved my life! This one pats you on the top of the head with their great furry hand. Ah, this one sees this. Baby skin looks very good. Meanwhile, next to you, Ilva has grabbed Fee and lifted her fully off the ground, just smushed into her chest. I feel stupid that I'm tearing up right now. <laughs> what are you two even doing here? Oh my god, who's watching your cat? This one's brother babysits. So true. We have so much to catch up on. We got kidnapped by pirates. Fee's dating one of them now. My father's about to try to kill all of us. Ilva gently sets Fee back on her feet on the docks and then says, We know. We come for glorious battle. Yeah, you sure did. Leo climbs out of this one's arms meekly. Okay, so all of the pirate monarchs are also here, right? Is anybody else here that I recognize? You watch all of the officers of the crew disembark from the Banshee after the captain. And behind them, you see Lorelai scraping what looks like soap off of her tongue with her hands. And next to her, you see your cousin, Lark Valsine, yelling. <laughs> that was so cool! You were like, bah, 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 and they were like, ah! Leo puts a hand up to high-five Lorelai as she passes, and then gives Lark a little upwards nod. Sup? Sup? Lark, just bouncing, goes, I expected that to be really scary, but it was so cool! I'm really happy for you, but I can't match this energy right now. Where's Adra? Adra is rolling down the gangplank behind them, <laughs> muttering to herself. And behind her, you see your Aunt Nora readjusting her armor with your uncles Berets and Aaron behind her. And from behind you, you hear your mom say, Nora? Nora just stops. Aaron and Boreas both run right into her. She looks down the docks and yells, Addy? And she just jumps off the gangplank onto the dock. She's running. You watch her scoop your mom into a big hug. And once Boreas hits the docks, he also hurries off in a way that you know is meant to look dignified. <laughs> Behind them, you see Florian Javaris and you watch a blur go past you as Arave runs onto this gangplank, like shoving people out of her way and stopping right in front of Florian. She puts her braids back in place, kind of dusts off her jacket and says, just so you know, I didn't miss you that bad. Florian grins at her, gives her a little kiss on the forehead and then says, yeah, but I know who you did miss. And then he whistles sharply, and from the deck of Agrippina the Red's steamship, a dire elk stands and shakes his head, giant rack of antlers almost hitting several pirates on the deck. And Arave just, you have never seen her like yell before, but she yells, Phineas! And much like your Aunt Nora just did, dives off the gangplank, runs. Leo bites his lip to keep from laughing and then turns back around to look at where Florian is still standing on the gangplank. Hey, Florian, long time no see. Got somebody down here I think you'll want to say hi to. Florian tilts his head at you as he's walking down the gangplank and goes, Uh, what are you talking about? Um, where's Sid? still standing at the end of the docks. Like, your entire party has started to move down, but Sid 
stands alone, dwarfed by his hierophant's robes, arms folded over his chest. Leo just sort of jerks his head towards him. There's a beat of silence, and then Florian runs. Sid and Sabine have been very careful to keep physical contact between the two of them as rare as possible. And you get the feeling that that is a dance they've been perfecting for decades, the choreography of which is hard to unlearn. Florian has never been a part of that. He gets to the end of these docks and just absolutely scoops it into his arms. There's a weird moment of cognitive dissonance because in the time that you have known him, he has never seemed like a child to you. Florian scoops him up and he resists for about a second and then just collapses in on himself and just puts his head on Florian's shoulder and you hear an ugly sob. Aw. Where's Fee? Can I talk to Fee right now? You could try, but Fee has walked away and she and the captain and Sabine are like passionately making out. Yeah, cool. Not interrupting that. Who's around me? This one and Ilva mostly, but Zed is crossing the docks to come up to you. Florian is hugging Sid. Your mom and Nora are chattering back and forth at each other while Boreas stands there awkwardly. You watch Adana gesture vaguely at Celica, who just goes very stiff. Various parts of your party and all of the pirates are kind of congregating to catch everybody up. You watch Lorelai get hoisted up on Yu's shoulders as it glasses in sunshine and just do like the jock fist pump. Leo looks around at all of these people. People who he has helped and have helped him in return. People he considers family. And then looks back over at Zed and breaks out into a slow, cautious smile. What do you know? I've got more people looking out for me than just you. Zed laughs and brings you in for a sweeping victorious kiss as all of your friends and allies stand on the docks of Luxtagallen, enclosed by the collected forces of all of the pirates in the local sphere of influence, basking in this small victory that has prevented the inevitable. Leo nods at everybody, and then looks over at Sabine. Okay, open that magnificent mansion back up. We've all got a conversation to have. Are you just taking everybody back up to the tower and the magnificent mansion? I mean, the specifications on the spell say that it's capable of producing a banquet that can feed a hundred people, so if there's less than a hundred people down here, I'm assuming it can hold us all. You lead everybody on these docks up to the Magnificent Mansion. The various crews of the Pirate Monarch ships, excepting the captain's various officers, go and row back into the protective line around the island. I think you get into the Magnificent Mansion and Florian Javaris just stops in the entry hall, slowly pushes his sunglasses down his nose, very deliberately looks around. And then says, uh, Sabine. And as spectral young Sabines run around trying to take everybody's jackets, the real Sabine says, yeah. Florian goes, can we reopen a conversation about you seeing a therapist? It really does do wonder, Sabine. I mean... I can't really pontificate, I've only ever been to one session, but in that time, I've picked up a constructive hobby, and yeah, I still have weird ghosts of my past following me around, but that's not entirely my fault. Sabine pauses awkwardly, and then says, Can I worry about surviving the week before you all pressure me into going to counseling? Please? Yeah, not a popular opinion to have, but I agree, let's put everybody's mental health on the back burner until we make sure we're not all going to die. Okay, so, 
I am meeting my father at the docks tomorrow to discuss terms of engagement. We will clearly need to have measures in place if those talks fall through. So, all of our pirate friends, I assume, will be back on your ships. Which brings us to the next point. I have a spell in place inside the tower that will let me and up to five other people teleport up there instantly if things get froggy. I'm sure Father will be bringing back up to the tune of Alasha and Kimrel knows who else. So I need to figure out who my backup is. Fee, obviously. Fee nods and says, yeah, obviously. And then she turns to Sabine and says, you and Leo are the best negotiators here. Would you be okay? Sabine sets her jaw and says, yeah, I'd enjoy the opportunity for a face-to-face -face with Alasha Dakarin. And then she turns to you and says, if that sounds all right. Yeah, yeah, it would be beneficial to have you there for beacon reasons, too, in case Alasha decides to try something. Okay, that's two. Three more. Zed raises a hand. I mean, I'm fast and I can land a pretty good punch. If we're worried about things getting violent, I'm good to have around. You sure are. Um, and honestly, I'm gonna need you for moral support. Okay, that's three. I, uh, hate to bring it up, but Fen, do you think your father's gonna be there? Fen grimaces and kind of shuffles awkwardly. Uh, my dad's a lot of things, but he's a good bodyguard. Wherever your father goes, he'll be following. Do you think you could reason with him? Maybe get a few more people over onto our side? Uh, honestly, I don't know. I could try if I could get him alone, but he's always been the, uh, for Archduke and country type. Even so, just from a political standpoint, having a Tormer on our side gives us a little bit more legitimacy. I think it's a good idea if you come, as long as you're okay with that. Not to mention you're, you know, yoked. Uh, th thank you? He shakes his head. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll come along. Okay, one more person. Your mom kind of clears her throat and says, <clears throat> Obviously, I should be the sixth person in this little party. We have more than enough muscle. We have negotiators. I'm the most likely to see it if something's about to go wrong. Leo reacts with sheer panic for a second, but then carefully reins it back in. Oh no, 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 no. Experience, be damned, you're also the person here that's at the most risk and has already been hurt the most by the parties involved. Adana narrows her eyes at you and says, Laryl, this is what I do. It's what you did, and look what happened to you because of it. What happens if father decides to try it again? I won't watch you get hurt any more on my behalf. <laughs> And you don't think I've had my capabilities minimized quite enough? I didn't mean it like- I don't care how you meant it. This is my fight as much as it is anyone's. I am capable of filling a niche in this discussion that is necessary, and I will not be forced to sit up here while my son goes into negotiations with that monster! Your son, assuming that we all survive this, will be the Archduke of an entire nation soon, and does not need Mama there holding his hand to help him make political decisions. You have expanded perspective on the situation. Sure, so does Auntie Nora. Nora puts both hands up and takes a big step back. Oh, leave me out of this, please. You know what? No, I can't leave you out of this. Executive decision, Auntie Nora, you are person number six, and that's final. Everybody in the pirate fleets, be back on your ships by morning. Fee, do you mind figuring out the distribution of any infantry we might have, just in case things pop off and the Navy manages to make landfall? Fee looks between you and Adana like she's watching a tennis match for a second. 
Yeah, I can do that. And Adana, visibly seething, grabs your arm and just tows you away from the group. Uh Uh-oh, I'm grounded. Adana drags you off into the dining room off of this entry hall. You can hear people discussing plans in low voices. And as soon as she's got you in this room, Adana brings her hands together and then separates them with that glowing cat's cradle between them. Looks deep into it and then looks up at you and says, There is a 5% chance he budges on this. There is a 50% chance someone dies during this negotiation. There's a 100% chance that that person is not going to be you. I lost you once. I lost you, and I just got you back, and I'm not going to lose you again. And you think I'm willing to lose you? This is my responsibility, Mom. And not just a personal sense of duty, or guilt, or what the hell ever. I am talking divinely ordained responsibility. And I know that you're my mother, and I know that you love me, and I know that you want to help, but... I'm not a little boy anymore. I grew up. And you weren't there to see it, and that is not your fault. But I am going toe-to-toe with the person whose fault it is. Hasn't he hurt us enough? I'm gonna roll something. Adana sets her jaw, nods, and says... Fine. I'll just sit here and twiddle my thumbs, I guess. Roll insight, please. Well, that sucked. That's a 15. Yeah, she's pissed. She spins on her heel and walks away. Mom, don't... (sighs) Damn it. Leo stands there and lets her go. And then feeling like an absolute pile of shit, he's gonna go check back in on Fee and everybody else. Everybody else has mostly cleared out of the entry hall. Fee is standing there awkwardly, and you watch as Adana brushes past her, going in the opposite direction. She grimaces, looks at you, and goes, Uh, we got everything organized. Yeah. Great. Sounds like we have all our T's crossed and I's dotted. We should all go rest up. Tomorrow's gonna be a big day. Down to the wire, is there anything else you want to do? As everybody else goes off to take their trance, I just stay down there with Fee for a while. Fee kinda braces her hands behind her neck, nods. Ugh, okay, all right. Yeah. You know, I really thought I was past the point of needing the validation of somebody telling me that I'm doing the right thing, but do you think we're doing the right thing? I think we're doing the only thing. No matter what happens tomorrow, I love you. Yeah. Love you too. And Fee's gonna give you a big hug. Leo hugs her back just as tight for a really long time. And then he's gonna step back, go upstairs, and go off to his and Zed's room. Fee, you wake up the next morning to a conspicuous absence on one side of you in the bed. The captain apparently got up in the wee hours of the morning and left to go back onto the ship. And you are awoken to the sound of somebody pounding on your door, and your brother's voice out in the hallway going, All right, rise and shine, let's do this. Fee groans and then rolls out of bed, gets dressed. I think at earliest possible opportunity, she's going to grab Sabine and give her a long, sweet kiss. Sabine actually stays in bed while you're up getting ready. 
you remember that she was up pacing the bedroom long after you laid down to take your trance, so she's still pretty drowsy. But eventually, she gets up, also gets ready for the day, puts on her black leather beacon armor, and presses her coin into the breastplate. The members of your party that are going to these negotiations, so yourself, your brother, Zed, Sabine, Fen, and your Aunt Nora all sort of gather in the foyer of this magnificent mansion. And as Leo is getting ready to lead the charge out the front door, you hear a voice from off in the dining room go, Oh no, you all need to eat. Adana, surrounded by a flock of little semi-transparent spectral Sabines, comes out, holding a tray of breakfast sandwiches. I'm not going to turn it down. <laughs> Fee squints at Adana for a moment, grabs a sandwich, and goes, Thank you for thinking of us, even though it's sort of not the time, but... Everybody here looks kind of awkward, but you notice that your Aunt Nora has retreated into the farthest possible corner as she nibbles on this bacon, egg, and cheese bagel. Adana and Leo are very calculatedly not talking to each other. And just before she turns around with her empty serving tray and heads back into the dining room, she reaches out and clutches a hand in a vice grip around your wrist. Ferrara, I want you to listen to me. Somebody has to. Fee grimacing says, I'm listening, you're hurting my wrist. Sorry, sorry. Her grip loosens, and her hand comes up and goes white-knuckled around the handle of this tray. Just, when you go down there, use your voice. He doesn't get to take it away again. No. He doesn't. Fee nods. And leads the rest of the group out of the Magnificent Mansion. As your party closes in on the beach, you see that the naval blockade around Luxtogallen is still pretty ironclad. Off in the bay between the island and the shores of southern Australia, you see the ship floating on the waves, waiting for something to happen. But, more pressingly, you see an Australian naval vessel anchored just off the docks, and a rowboat making its way towards the shore. In it, you see three figures. Fen's father, Reese Tormer, your father's bodyguard, and arguably oldest friend, is just going at these oars trying to get the boat to shore. You see Elasha sitting on one of the narrow bench seats, smoothing down her skirts and adjusting her cane against the side of the boat. And you see your father, decked out in full mage's armor, hair pulled back into a neat ponytail, trying to look composed and in control. But as they get closer, Fee, you see that he looks rough. He has clearly not gotten as much rest as he probably would have liked to recently. Big, dark circles under his eyes. Looks like he hasn't shaved in a couple days. Your party reaches the docks at about the same time that the boat pulls up to them. Fen's dad lashes it up onto the docks, and they all disembark. It's like this okay corral situation as both of your parties move to meet in the middle of these docks. You feel Leo next to you go very tense. Elasha stands there, face pinched and worried. Sir Reese Tormer is looming in the background with one hand on his great axe, desperately trying to catch his son's eye while Fen is pointedly not looking at him. Your father looks back and forth between you and your brother, and in his eyes is a level of 
barely contained and incomprehensible rage and hate that sends a chill down your spine. Fee, do me a favor and roll a perception check. 14 because of reliable talent. Okay, I'm gonna roll something real quick. Okay, so you don't notice anything out of the ordinary, other than the fact that the entire situation is out of the ordinary, obviously. Your father squints at the new gold circlet that Leo's been wearing, and his lip curls. That's not your crown to wear. Leo just smirks at him. Yeah, and technically that one's not yours, but I didn't invite you here so we could split hairs. Your father's hands clench into fists at his sides, and you can see inky tendrils of dark magic starting to creep around them. No, you invited me here so we could talk. Go ahead. Talk. I would be enchanted to know how you two think this is going to end. Fee smiles tightly. <laughs> Brave words from a man who holds none of the cards. Our terms are extremely simple, Father. You surrender quietly, you come with us back to Valentol and face whatever justice the people of Australia think is necessary, and we stop sinking boats under you and let you hold on to what little dignity you have left. I am Australia's justice. You two are a pair of insolent children with no idea how the world works. He kind of jerks his head back over his shoulder at where Agrippina the Red's Valduran steamships are still blocking in what's left of the navy. Bringing Valduran scum back to the shores of this nation after everything they've done just so you can settle a score. When it comes to stopping you from causing more damage, an ally is an ally. And there's no love lost between the Valduran government and Agrippina the Red. <laughs> well, I guess I'm disappointed but not surprised that you have friends in low places. Has it crossed either of your minds how Australia is going to view this little farce the two of you are putting on? A band of pirates and thieves and traitors threatening the hard-won stability of a nation that's known it for centuries? Says the treasonous murderer that's put gallons of blood on all of their hands. How do you think they'll view you? In any case, spare us the grandstanding, father. Your disapproval means less than nothing, and petty taunts make it clear how much you are grasping at straws. Bring your own terms to the table or stop wasting our time. Oh, he takes a step towards you. And simultaneously, Leo steps in front of you, and Alasha grabs the back of his mage's armor and holds him back. Oh, that's sweet. You're trying to scare us to cover up the fact that we scare you. Neither of us are under your thumb anymore, Father. We're not frightened children, or any of the women that you have used and discarded. We're the people that are going to tear down everything you've built, one way or another. That inky necrotic magic floating around his clenched fists intensifies, and his eyes flash in kind of a weird arcane way. And in your head, you feel the ping of a message cantrip go off. Leo's voice says, Look, as much as I'm enjoying the antagonism, we might want to dial it back. He looks... unstable, and we're in a poor position for everything to pop off here and now. Fee sends a message back, says, He's a bad negotiator on his best day, and you're a good one on your worst. I'm trying to soften him up for you. Your father, still visibly and magically seething, narrows his eyes at the two of you. You're welcome to try. I've been doing this for a lot longer than either of you. You think you're the ones holding all the cards? That's fine. 
I've seen them all. There's not a single one in the deck that can surprise me. From the shore end of these docks behind you, a voice says, I wouldn't be so sure about that. Yes! Fee, you were not successful on that perception roll earlier to notice Adana following you in the woods with a Pass Without a Trace spell on her. But she is clearly visible now. Walking down the docks, elbowing you and Leo out of the way, and standing between the two of you and your father. You can count on one hand the amount of times in your life that you have seen raw, honest emotion on your father's face. And this is one of those times. He freezes, and the magic dies around his hands. And he looks shocked and guilty and a little bit hopeful. Addy? Adana moves a bit closer, and you can see that odd, lost expression again, like she's unstuck in time. She closes the distance between them, and reaches up one hand to press her palm to the side of his face. And then you watch her regain lucidity as she cocks her hand back, curls it into a fist, and punches him straight in the fucking mouth. Woo! I'm gonna roll to hit. <gasps> yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> yes! <laughs> Oh, there is justice in the world, my friends. It is out there. Adana Valsign just rolled a fucking nat 20 to punch her husband in the face. <laughs> oh, I love this. It's an unarmed strike, so it only does one, technically two from the crit, plus Adana's strength modifier. So three damage. But because it was a nat 20 flavor-wise, I'm gonna say she breaks his fucking nose. Yeah! Shit goes completely off the rails. Leo yells and dives forward, trying to pull Adana off of your father while she is trying to scratch and claw and bite at him like a wild fucking animal. Elasha is yelling, your father is bleeding profusely. Reese Tormer is standing there holding his axe, repeatedly going, What? 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 And Adana is just screeching. You pompous, self-absorbed, short-sighted piece of shit! I could have let you go. I could have forgiven you for what you did to me, but you fucked with my kid. You hurt our son. How fucking dare you? Leo is frantically trying to pull her back, but it's not working because he has negative one to strength and can't really do anything. He just starts yelling, Zed, help! I'm going to roll to see if he's going to help. No. <laughs> Leo, while trying to wrangle his mother, gives you kind of a betrayed look, but then Zed shoves past you, and I'm going to roll a grapple check for him. Fifteen. Okay, I'm going to roll acrobatics for Adana to see if she slips out of his grip. Nine. She does not. Zed picks her up and just slings her over his shoulder and starts jogging down the docks away from all of this. The entire time Adana is still glaring back at all of you, pointing viciously at your father. You had better pray that Leoril finds you on that battlefield before I do, Morlin. You'd better fucking pray. Zed and Adana disappear up the beach, and there is a cavernous silence that follows. Your father stands up a little straighter, swipes a hand under his bloody nose, and then he stiffens his posture, nods, looks at once more broken and more dangerous than you've ever seen him, and turns his focus back to you and Leo. Fine. You want my terms? My terms are that the two of you surrender now, and you get a clean, painless death. Or you insist on continuing to push me, and your deaths will be neither clean nor painless. 
Elasha's eyes go wide, and she pivots around to take a step in front of him. Morlin, that is not what we talked about! <laughs> Great plan. All 10,000 years of family history that you are so desperate to pretend means anything ended here because you don't get your way. He looks fucking unhinged. His teeth are bared, his circlet is crooked on his head from where Adana just punched him in the face, and he is attempting to stalk forward towards you and Leo as Alasha keeps moving back and forth trying to block his access. Family history. I have given everything to this legacy and where has it gotten me? Years of making the decisions that no one else would, losing everything and everyone I cared about. <laughs> and how was I repaid for it? With disregard and disloyalty. That's my legacy. A lifetime of being a weapon in other people's wars. I'm still a weapon. But now the war is mine. And as far as I'm concerned, Australia can burn once I'm done with it. <sighs> and you. You could have both had it so easy if you had just listened to me. But now you can burn with it. Elasha reaches up and gets him by the shoulders. Listen, you are not thinking clearly, okay? Remember what we talked about. This is not the plan. And your father just snarls back. Fuck the plan, Alasha. Get out of the way. Fee takes a step back and raises her shield. Beside you, you see Leo's hand tighten on his knife. And at your backs, you feel Fen heft his axe and hear Sabine's bells start to jingle. Elasha looks absolutely destroyed. She lets go of your father's shoulders and turns around, and there is a long moment where the two of you make eye contact. I am going to roll a d20, and if I roll an even number, Elasha will do something, and if I roll an odd number, Elasha will do something else. Three. Caught in the middle of the two warring halves of her heart, Elasha stands there, looks at you, and grimly nods. I choose you. And then she pivots on her heel, brings her wand arm up, and casts harm on your father. She's going to use three sorcery points to do heightened spell to give Morlin disadvantage on this DC 18 constitution saving throw. That's a 13. Not going to do it. So Elasha's going to roll 14d6 necrotic damage. And she's going to burn a further sorcery point to do Empowered Spell and reroll five of these. Fee, very suddenly, as you watch this happen, you have a bit of a flashback to a long-ago magic lesson with Alasha. And remember her casting the spell on a dummy out in the training yard, as she told you that harm was actually a very merciful spell because it can do massive amounts of necrotic damage, but it cannot kill. Mechanically, the spell cannot take someone below one hit point. Elasha does 63 damage, takes him down over half of his max HP. And then Reese, who has finally come to the understanding of what's actually going on here and how far gone the situation is, yells, Fen, get them out of here! And he's gonna roll three attacks. 13, 19, 28. Morland's AC is a 13. All three of those hit. And he lays into your father with his great axe for a further 30 damage. 
Marlon Valsine, with 26 hit points left, extremely bloody, stumbles back from being hit with this great axe, looks back and forth between the last two people he had left who have both turned on him, and then fixes his gaze on Alasha. After all this time, even you. And then he uses his only ninth level spell slot to cast Power Word Kill. Ilasha is at max HP. She has all 99 of her hit points. But the text of this spell says, You utter a word of power that can compel one creature you can see within range to die instantly. If the creature you choose has 100 hit points or fewer, it dies. It is instantaneous. One second, Elasha is there, still standing between you and your father, wand arm raised. And the next, the light leaves her eyes and she crumples down to a heap on the docks, dead. Fee screams. She just yells, no! And tries to lunge forward. Fen is also yelling frantically and trying to scrabble to the front of the pack as you watch your father turn around and fix his attention on Restormare. But before either of you can do anything, Leo uses his only sixth level spell slot to cast Word of Recall. And you, and Fen, and Sabine, and your Aunt Nora, and your brother, all disappear. And that is where we end for this week. (coughs) Wow. (laughs) So, um, this is the end. And we'll see where the end takes us next time. On Compelled Duel... Hey everybody, Barry here with the postscript, just clearing up a couple housekeeping things here at the end of the episode. As always, I'm going to go ahead and plug our social media profiles. You can find us on Twitter, Tumblr, and TikTok at Compelled Duel. We have lots of other cool stuff going on, however, an official website, an official Spotify profile, our official merch store, stuff like that. You can find all that stuff linked on any of our various social media profiles. If you're interested in supporting the show, we ask that you consider heading over to patreon.com slash compelled duel, where starting at just $2 a month, you can get access to all kinds of cool patron perks, including early access to episodes, access to exclusive playlists and bonus content, and even handwritten letters from your favorite character every month. If you're interested in supporting the show in ways other than pledging to our Patreon, We ask that if you're listening to us on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, that you leave us a rating and a review, since that helps the show get promoted to a wider audience. We host a weekly Q&A show on our YouTube every week, and we would love to see you show up for that, ask a couple questions. We always have a really fun time. And as always, if you like what you're hearing on the show, we ask that you just tell a couple friends about it. And if they like it, ask them to tell a couple friends as well. Word of mouth advertising is the most powerful tool we have at our disposal. The final combat of our first campaign will be premiering live on our YouTube channel on Thursday, June 2nd, 2022 at 5 p.m. Pacific time. It will be premiering at 9 a.m. Pacific time for our patrons, and if you want to stick around and just listen to it on your local podcatcher, it'll be up on Friday, June 3rd at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Here we go, y'all. We'll see you in two weeks.